All right, so in this video, we're going to take a look at the section B of the recent year 13 half term assessment uh, based on SHM and circular motion. So we'll start off with some circular motion. So we've got a lead ball of mass 0.25 kilograms swung around on the end of a string. So it goes in a horizontal circle and the ball travels at a constant speed of 8.6 meters per second. Calculate the angle in degrees through which the string turns in 40 seconds. So the basic principle we're going to be using here is to get an angle, we're going to need the angular speed times the time, because that would give us radians per second times the time. And then we also remember that we can convert from angular speed to uh, the tangential speed using this equation, so we can get the angle in radians is going to be V T over R. Uh, so let's calculate that first of all. So we're going to put in uh, 8.6 times 0.4 and the radius was 1.5. So if we type that in, so 1.5 gives us 2.29 blah blah blah. blah radians but in the question it asked for you in degrees so to go from radians to degrees we times by 180 divided by pi gives us uh, 131.39 blah 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 which will be 1.3 times 10 to the 2 uh, degrees uh, there uh, just a, a word of warning in this situation, instead of using the symbol here, I would highly recommend just writing degrees so that doesn't get mistaken for a 10 to the power of 20. Uh, just a thing to look out for and a, a bit of advice there. Okay, so that's the first question there. Okay, so calculate the tension string, assuming the string is horizontal. So if the string is horizontal, the tension is going to be the centripetal force. Uh, so a centripetal force is given using m v squared over r. So its mass was 0.25 times 8.6 squared divided by 1.5. And then when we type that in there, we get like 12.326 yada yada yada, which is 12 newtons. Now you could have solved this question by calculating the angular speed and doing angular speed squared times the radius, but this is the most straightforward way of getting to the answer. Okay, so the string will break when the tension exceeds 60 newtons. Calculate the number of revolutions that makes in one second when the tension is 60 newtons. So revolutions per second is the same as frequency. So what we're trying to get is frequency. So centripetal force is given by m omega squared r and an omega is equal to 2 pi f so what we can do is let's um, write that out first so a force equals mass times by 2 pi f squared r so to get f we're going to end up square rooting so uh, what we're going to do, we're going to have force divided by mass divided by the radius. That's when the square rooting is going to be complete. And then we're also then going to divide that by 2 pi. So it's going to be the square root of 60 over 0.25 times by 1.5 times by 1 over 2 pi. So let's calculate that. So 60 divided by 0.25 divided by 1.5 square root divided by 2 divided by pi gives you 2.013. So it's essentially 2.0 revolutions per second there. Um, that's the way I'd calculate it. Alternatively, you could work out what the angular speed is. That would give you the number of radians per second. And then you work out, divide that by 2 pi, that would give you revolutions per second. So that's an alternative there, but this is the way I would think through of doing it there. And so let's move on to the next part of this question. 
Okay, so the next, next question we're going to look at how we can apply Newton's laws to explain what's happening in, in order for an object to move in circular motion. So let's first like sketch a diagram of what an object in circular motion looks like. So we've got an object going around in a circle, and say the object is up here at the top. To be in circular motion, it must have a force acting towards the center, and it would be traveling at a tangential velocity of v, and it would have, uh, um, let's say, its mass m. So that's the scenario to be like in circular motion. So let's explain how that works in terms of Newton's laws, and then we'll look at the end how why the string can't be horizontal. So I'm not going to write this out in full because um, I don't have the space or the neat enough handwriting to write on my screen like this, but I'll talk you through the key points. Okay, so the first key thing to recognize is that as the object is going round your circle here, the direction is always changing. So let's put that first. So your direction is always changing. That's a, so if it's going around a circle, its direction is changing. So what does that mean? It means that the velocity is changing. Because remember, velocity is a vector, so both direction and magnitude would need to be constant for velocity to be constant. Direction is changing, and then the velocity is changing. Therefore, the object is the object is accelerating, and it's always accelerating, so the velocity is constantly changing as well, because the direction of the acceleration is constantly changing. So if we, what we can draw from this is that there's a resultant force, force acting on it. The velocity is changing, then it must be being acted on by resultant force. Now, um, to link in Newton's second law, um, we know that there is we know that there's a resultant force towards the center. It's called a centripetal force. That's that's what centripetal means. It means center seeking. We know the resultant force. So then, by applying Newton's second law, where we know that force is direct proportion to acceleration, essentially, we can now glean the direction of the acceleration. So if the force is towards the center, because it's centripetal, we know it's accelerating towards the center of the circle at any moment in time. That's how we link in Newton's second law. So, why is it that speed is always constant and it go as it goes around the circle so so it's because the force or acceleration is always uh, perpendicular to velocity this is one of the conditions to be in circular motion the force has to be uh, perpendicular to the velocity therefore the magnitude of the speed will always stay the same, essentially. Um, so that's like when we have satellites, the gravitational force is always perpendicular to the motion, and in electron orbits around atoms, the electric force is always perpendicular. That's what's required to be in circular motion. So that would be why the speed doesn't change, because it's always perpendicular, so it's never doing any work on it to change the kinetic energy. So let's look at how we can apply Newton's third law so if we've got, I think I said we've got a string there. So if the uh, so we're saying this essentially the string applies force towards center on object, then the object will apply an equal and opposite force. So a force equal in magnitude, but outwards. 
on the string. So essentially that's how Newton's third law applies here. So this object is feeling a force pulling it in towards the centre. So if your string is, say, being held by a person, that person at the centre will feel a force outwards from the object there. So that's what's going on in terms of Newton's third law. So let's explain why the string can't be horizontal, and we'll do it using a diagram. So if we look at the object in horizontal circular motion, it's got a weight force acting vertically downwards, and if it's in horizontal circular motion, the tension force will be acting horizontally there. Um, so to stay in equilibrium, there would have to be a force acting upwards equal to mg. So a component of the tension would have to be acting upwards to cancel that out. So it doesn't move up or down. So it doesn't accelerate up or down, I should say, sorry. But if the force is horizontal, there is no component in the vertical direction. So it can't stay in vertical equilibrium. So that's why your string always has to be at an angle and make what's called a conical pendulum. Um, but if you're trying to make horizontal circular motion, you can't do it with a horizontal string. That's not possible um, for the conditions of equilibrium there. So that's what's going on with this question. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, so we're going to look at some SHM in this question. So a simple pendulum is given a small displacement from the equilibrium position and performs simple harmonic motion. What is meant by simple harmonic motion? So the general form, so the force or acceleration, will be the direct proportion to the minus displacement. So so either the force or acceleration uh, you would have to write this out properly but I don't have space that's so directly proportional to the displacement but it's always in the opposite direction so it's always directed towards uh, the equilibrium position Okay. That's what SHM is. That's a definition you just have to know for this course. So calculate the frequency of oscillation of the simple pendulum of length 9.84 millimetres. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. So uh, as part of this, we're also going to be using uh, G equals 9.81. So looking at these three significant figure number, three significant figure number. So the appropriate number of significant figures would be three as well. So let's look at how the calculation goes. So frequency is 1 over 2 pi square root of g over l. Essentially is the inverse of the time period equation. So it's going to be uh, 9.81 divided by 0 0.984, because we need it in meters to use in the equation, times 1 over 2 pi. When we calculate that, we get 0 0.503, and it's a frequency, so it's measured in hertz there. So we've given, just to check, we've got three significant figures, because preceding zeros are not significant, so that would be the right number there. Okay, the acceleration of the bob, when it is displaced from the equilibrium position, it, well, its displacement is 42 millimetres, so the general equation we need here is... squared x. So that's going to be minus 2 pi, uh, the unrounded frequency, so 0 0.50 blah blah blah, squared times by uh, 42 times 10 to the minus 3 because it was in millimeters. And when we put that in, we get minus 0 0.42 ms to the minus 2. Um, so we've got You've got a positive displacement here, so we get a negative acceleration, so there's a quick check. We know we're getting the right answer there. Okay, so a simple pendulum of time period 1.9 seconds is set up on another side of another of two seconds, and they're displaced in the same direction released. At what time interval 
will they next move in phase? I think the easiest way of doing this is finding the lowest common multiple of 1.9 0 and 2.00. Zero zero. Uh, so let's do that. So the way we do that is we need to um, deal with the fact that 1.9 can't be expressed as a product of come up factors. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat that as 19. Uh, 2 we can deal with because uh, it's a product of prime numbers, it's 2 and 1. So then the lowest common multiple is just going to be 2 times 19, which is 38 seconds there. That's how long it would essentially take. Now, ordinarily with the lowest common multiple, what you do is take back the power of 10. But um, actually in this example, this one is the first time those two pendulum would be in sync because it's the first time the lowest common multiple is actually a, like a, like a round number and actually they've lined up with each other. Uh, so it's not exactly a lowest common multiple type approach. Another way of approaching this question is to think they get out of phase with each other by 0.1 seconds each oscillation. Um, so then you can think about, okay, so if they're getting out of phase with each other by 0.1, how many oscillations does it take to get back so they're in phase with each other? If you do that, you'll come up with the same answer. So there's a couple of ways of dealing with this question there. Okay. All right, so in this question, we're going to have a look at some more circular motion uh, in a different context. So in the case of going over a bridge, uh, so we've got a radius of curvature which is like the uh, radius in your centripetal equation and we've got it's mass m going at speed v so draw arrows on figure two below to show the forces that act on the parcel as it passes over the highest point of the ridge remember the parcel was on the floor so there's going to be two forces acting on it uh, there will be its weight force acting from its center of mass and there'll be a reaction force from the floor those are the two forces acting on it. It's going at constant speed so there's not going to be a forward or a frictional force back because it's going at constant speed so there's no horizontal forces in play here. Okay so that completes um, this part here. Uh, what I lot of saw from a lot of people is people drew on another force and called it the centripetal force um, but if an object is in circular motion, that doesn't mean there's an additional force called the centripetal force acting on it. What it means is the resultant of these two forces is equal to the centripetal force. So let's see how that works. So write down the equation that relates the normal contact force and the like, mass velocity and the distance. So um, the centripetal force can be directed towards the center. So the centripetal force, so mv squared over R is going to be equal to the resultant force. So that would be the weight force, so mg minus R there, because that would be the resultant acting towards the center. So we wanted to express it in terms of R, so it's going to be mg minus mv squared over R there. So that's going to be the equation that we're looking for. All right. Then what we're going to do is calculate what the reaction force is in certain parameters. So remember we had this equation. I've uh, factorized it so we don't end up with loads of masses. So it's going to be 12, 9.81 minus 11 squared over 23. And when we uh, plug all those numbers in, we get like 54.8. 589 blah, blah blah so 55 newtons there that would be the reaction force at this point um, so explaining what happens to r if v gets higher and what are the significance of it being v being 15 would be uh, so let's first look at the general format in terms of explaining what's going on so what we can see is if you end up going faster, this part increases, these all stay the same. So what happens overall is that the reaction force is going to get lower and lower 
um, the further faster you get, the smaller this reaction force gets, essentially. So, reaction force will decrease is what happens. If we put in V equals 15, and then it's radius was uh, 23, we get um, a value of uh, 0.32. So we're getting around a value of zero newtons approximately. That's the significance of the 15 meters per second. At that point, what we're actually getting is a reaction force of zero. And what that means is uh, that the object is about to leave the floor. Um, so that would be highly dangerous uh, because the parcel is about to lose contact with the floor if the reaction force goes like less than zero it doesn't it just means it's not in contact with the floor anymore uh, so that would be dangerous for anyone inside the van not great there um, so that's what's going on there and that completes the questions in this part of the paper